uh, I guess <laughs> I'm gonna say hi, everybody. Yeah, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe the first thing is, thank you for inviting me to give this talk today. It's, it's a total pleasure. And uh, thank you for you to be here, right? So it's very nice to see you guys here today and the, and the people online as well. Um, oh, sure, sorry. Can you hear now? Is it better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll try to speak louder as well. Um, yes. Yeah, so I'm a professor at the University of Victoria. You can um, maybe guess right away, right? I'm, uh, I have a big, strong accent. So hopefully everybody will be able to understand me. Uh, I'm originally from Brazil and I've been in Victoria for the last 20 years working at the university. Um, and doing all kinds of research related to oceans and uh, wetlands, wetlands mostly in Brazil, uh, and oceans in, in Canada. Uh, as I was introduced, I have a background in ocean science, in oceanography, and, and, and the use of satellite to understand the changes in the ocean. And I apply this kind of technology uh, to understand changes in the Amazon floodplains, in the Pantanal, one of the largest pristine wetlands in, in, in the world, which is the central, in the center part of South America. And I also use this technology to understand what's happened in the British Columbia oceans, for example, how the productivity of the ocean change in space and time, and how this is related to the food web, uh, including Pacific salmon, which is uh, uh, some of, there's a lot of concern about that uh, in, in BC right now with the changes in return of the different populations in salmon. So we work a lot with many partners to try to understand what is guiding the shifts in the environmental conditions and how this may be related to the food web and Pacific salmon. The other habitat of Pacific salmon that I work with is the kelp habitat. As Pacific salmon, juvenile salmon come from the riverine systems, as many of you probably know much better than I know, uh, they encounter <coughs> these uh, coastal habitats, especially eugrass beds and kelps. And it's a very important area uh, in which they are protected from predation and they also feed a lot. So they get a little bit fat there. And uh, as they grow in, in, in slightly larger fish and more healthy, they start the migration to Northern British Columbia, Alaska and Central Pacific and then return depending on the population a few years later to spawn and start this cycle all over again. So many of these areas have been changed in the past, uh, both the ocean conditions and the, the coastal habitats. And uh, many of my colleagues uh, are trying to really put, trying to put this puzzle together. What's causing those changes? Are, are the habitats decreasing? Is, the, is it the productivity of the ocean? Is predation? So what are the possible causes of those shifts that we're seeing in, in many species, including Pacific salmon? So with that introduction, uh, I will be talking about one of the, the, the themes of my research lab is looking at these habitats, specifically kelp, and how kelp has changed in space and time in British Columbia. Uh, and then what are the environmental conditions that are leading to these changes in British Columbia? Um, and to do that, I use a variety of data. And so I'm gonna go through that with you. And maybe if you have some burning questions, you can ask me right away, right? Uh, uh, so just stop me if you need, both uh, people in the Zoom or here. Uh, in the audience, and uh, I'll try to answer the best that I can. I'm not going to be very technical, but I can't avoid it <laughs> just because of uh, the nature, my nature, and the nature of data that I work with, with uh, a lot of satellite data. So it's going to be a little bit technical, uh, which I think is really cool. I really, when I give those talks, people really appreciate that because there's a lot of learning if it was something that was not part of your background. Right. So, so, but again, if you, uh, if you're not really understand what I'm talking about, just stop me. I would definitely try to rephrase and make sure that everybody is following. Okay. And, uh, um, it's a bit dark here, so you can't see everything that is written here, but the first thing that I want to do 
is acknowledged with respect to the Congan people in whose territories the University of Victoria stands. And I'm an employee of Victoria, of the University of Victoria. And I actually live very close to UVic. So that's where my house is as well. But as I said, I'm originally from Brazil and I'm from the territories of the two Pi Guarani nations in Brazil, right? So uh, once upon a time, it seemed that they were all related, right? And uh, so these are just different continents, but colonized by different nations. And in Brazil, in the area that I'm from, actually most of the coastal south of Brazil were, were territories of this very large tribe called the Tupi Guarani nations. So I'm trying to acknowledge them as well, because that's where I learned what I know these days and I exercise that in Canada. So I don't know if I can use this to shift. Yes. So the importance of kelp, I, again, many probably <laughs> You have a lot of experience with that, but just as, as a summary of it, in many parts of the world, it's not just in BC, we can have wild harvesting, farming, and we all know uh, in BC specifically, the spawn on kelp herring row, which is a hardly, it's very strongly harvested. And this has some changes recently. There are some issues with the habitats for herring spawning. And it's a, it's a big business. It's also a very important cultural practice in British Columbia, including uh, wild harvesting as well, right? So there's a lot of going on uh, about kelp use, what we call the blue economy in British Columbia and all over the world. The ecological importance of kelp are numerous. So uh, this is kind of a little cartoon, but you have your little kelp here and uh, you may have seen sea otters. There's a return of sea otters in many areas of British Columbia. Now it's amazing when we're doing field work, we see so many sea otters now, which is a really incredible thing that it's happening. And they use the habitat considerably for protection, for feeding. They eat a lot of the sea urchin, which is a good thing because the sea urchins like to eat the kelp. So we don't like the sea urchins, too many sea urchins on the kelp beds. And many fish, including juvenile fish and big fish, they use this area as protective area and area in which they feed, right? But this entire system here has many threatens associated to it. There are some biological threatens such as sea urchins that I mentioned, they really like to eat kelp. Uh, there are local threatens, for example, changes in the ocean, in the local ocean temperature is a big one. Kelp does not like very, very hot water. So they have kind of a thresholds in, in terms of temperature that they like the water. They like cold. You don't see these beautiful kelp forests in Brazil at all, right? Too warm. I like to swim there, but in terms of kelp, the kelp likes what's happening here right now. Uh, and there are what we call the large scale climate drivers. So when you have an El Nino year, a very strong El Nino year, you have warmer ocean temperatures and that is not good for kelp, right? When you have, uh, there's another uh, big, um, uh, in this year, climate driver called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is an interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean. And when it's very strong, it causes warm waters in British Columbia. Kelp also does not like those kind of years. So there's many things, many interactions happen to make this a very good habitat for kelp or not a very good habitat for kelp. Ocean temperature, as you may have heard, uh, it's changing, right, slowly. And some years we have those big heat waves, which we all have seen recently, which has impact the land with more firing, uh, with uh, like wildfire, with uh, big floodings. And the ocean has its parallel effect as well, right? So we have uh, in 2021, when the, everything got really hot in two or three, it, it, one week, the entire BC reached 40 degrees. I'm not sure if you remember that. The ocean around the Gulf Islands was 25, 26 degrees. That's the ocean temperature, right? That's kind of great to swim, not very good for any species living in that area, including kelp, right? So if we start to have those more and for longer periods, we're gonna have a change in, in the ocean. That's, a, that's a absolutely a for sure, right? Uh, so globally wise, 
uh, the distribution of kelp is illustrated here with those green lights, green, green lines. So don't worry too much about the different colors. It's just two different species. Uh, but you have a lot of kelp, as you can see here, in the north latitudes and in the southern latitudes. And again, this is related to the temperature. You don't see too much kelp, at least this kelp that we're talking about uh, on the tropical regions. Again, because kelp does not like warm waters. So we all know that. But the other interesting thing that uh, I'm showing this in this big map here is in the different parts of the world, what is likely threatening the, the, the conditions of kelp? meaning that kelp areas are disappearing or are under strong stress. And what you will see, you have a lot of information in the east coast of Canada, the US, Europe, Japan, uh, lots in Australia, lots of uh, things happening in Australia. However, it seems that everything is very peaceful in the west coast, uh, uh, in the west coast of Canada and, and in, in, in the Americas as well, in North America as a whole. But that's not the case. It's just, we don't have data. It's hard to believe, but uh, Canada just recently started to invest more on research to try to understand what's happened with kelp in the British Columbia coast. So we have a few people now with large projects, including the ones in my laboratory. We're trying to look at the BC scale, what's happened with kelp and why it's changed, what are the areas that are changing and what caused the changes in kelp. So hopefully we're going to have some information that can be added to this global compilation of threats to kelp. Together, based on what's available, uh, the, the, the latest update tells us there's, there's been a, about 35% decrease of kelp global-wise. None of these consider British Columbia because only now we have information about that. So it's, this is the most conservative number likely wrong, but we work with that to start with. So if you look at uh, what's happening in BC right now in terms of what has happened in the past and now we're trying to fix this problem is there are a few studies that shows uh, what's um, very localized studies that's uh, in the, the, the location, the publications and the, the dots are represent the location where they are that show a decrease in kelp. So you see the red dots here. You see areas that are more stable uh, here, which is something that we did in our lab uh, relatively recent, and areas that have seen an increase in kelp. This one specifically has been very much related to the return of sea otters uh, in this region of the west coast of Vancouver Island. But it's very uh, sparse, the information. We cannot build a picture about what's happening in BC with these four or five publications. It's like it's almost it's meaning, meaningless at the end, right? So with, with this in mind, what, what um, my, my lab, what we start to do was, okay, how can we take a step back? And instead of just looking in what's, what we have in terms of kelp now, can we go as back as we can in the past and, and see what we used to have in terms of kelp a hundred years ago? And this can be used as at least the best baseline that we can possibly have. It's not the best because BC was a red fully in development at that time and the coast was heavily used. So maybe it's not a baseline, but it's a back that we can do. So uh, I have a conversation with the Canadian Hydrographic Service. And uh, here are some examples of nautical charts. And we did a big, a big uh, 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 survey of all the data that they have, the nautical charts from the British. Uh, from about 1850 to 1950, a little bit earlier than that, 1930s. And we did this compilation of the best nautical charts that they had in their archives. And we digitized all of that. So it was a big project with them. Because what happened, why I decided to look at those charts was one day I was in my, one of my colleagues' office in, in the geography department, and I saw this beautiful old chart in, in a table. He is a cartographer, so he had all these cool maps. And I look at that and, and I said, whoa, what are those wiggly lines along the coast of BC here? And he said, I have no idea. And I was like, okay, we're doing some preliminary analysis of satellite data, and it's the same area that I see kelp today. 
It was around couch and area. And then I said, this is likely kelp. So I went to all the British archives in terms of reports and tried to figure it out if it was really kelp. And then what I found was that they actually, um, they actually had kelp as a navigation hazard. And because of that, they actually mapped the kelp. Lucky for us, right? So it was a total kind of, uh, it was a bad thing for them. And then this gave us baseline data. So with that in mind, I talk of the Canadian Hydrographic Service. <laughs> and, uh, and then we came up with a full mosaic. So these are 137 British Admiral charts, all put together here in the entire area of British Columbia, all the way to Puget Sound. And, and uh, uh, we had to do an ortho correction of all of that, right? Because not necessarily all the charts at that time we had the perfect geometry. So we made all the geometry corrected. And then after that, in a, in a, and we do that digitally, we digitize all the area that had kelp. And here it shows a little bit of an example. All those cute little wiggly lines here are areas of kelp. The red line is us digitizing it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an application called ArcGIS. Here's another one here, right? Showing the red lines around the kelp area. So that we did this for the entire coast, 137 optical charge, which was a lot of work, but it was kind of fun. But to do that, we did a very strong review of how those charts were built. So we could trust the data that we're putting together. So, and we went to, again, through all the reports and we look at the issues and why the what was the purpose of those, those charts? So there's many different purposes and that dictated to a certain extent the quality of the kelp map. So if you look at these two figures here, on your left side, you have a piece, just a tiny little piece as an example of an out, one of those charts at a scale to one to 500,000. And you have another one here at a scale of one to 6,000. So this is much better scale. So you can see the kelp much better than in this case here, right? So at the end of the day, uh, we chose the best scales, the best quality at the end of the charts with the best scale. And we put together this entire map for British Columbia. Uh, and we try to understand a little bit more about, okay, is there any ancillary information about how these were put together? So it was a lot of fun to do those uh, uh, surveys of archive data. Uh, so we, this is the same image as before, I think showing the area that were digitized and some of the rules that we took and the, the interpretation depending on the scale. So we went through all this process for all the charts and we came up, uh, again, it's a bit bright because of the lights, but uh, this is a, a satellite image as a background and what you see in red, is are the areas in which we map kelp, right? So um, can you guys see from the back there? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, so there's, there is uh, kelp all over the British Columbia coast, the Vancouver Island, Salish Sea. It's, it's quite amazing. So if we zoom in, ah, um, um, can we? Yeah, I don't think anyone will be able to see. <laughs> yeah, if you can put the lights down just a little bit more. Yes. Does the kelp end up in fjords or is it mainly along the coastline? No, it goes into fjords as well. It doesn't like uh, fresh water. So it does avoid areas in which you have a lot of fresh water coming in, either from glaciers or creeks or rivers. It doesn't like that. So it likes cold waters and, uh, and ocean. But you can have the kelp in the, in the, in the inlets. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, still can't see it, but don't know what to do about that. It's better than it was, yeah. Can well, you go back one slide? yes, I can. Yeah, that's a bit better, huh? You yeah. can see a little bit better now, yeah. Right. And uh, okay, so I'm gonna zoom in. The next one is a zoom in this area here, North Vancouver Island. And this was part of our process of uh, say, okay, how good are those maps that we're producing? So this is the north part of Vancouver Island. And it's really kind of sad because even the red, you can't see very well, but this is mapped with the Nautical chart with the British charts. 
So this is all kelp area. And this is a compilation from British Columbia of all the data that was once available, but not from the British nautical charge, showing similar areas. And this area here is all red. So there's kelp all over the place here, very similar to here, which shows that, yeah, our maps actually were quite good. The kelp uh, was there in a the, hundred years ago is the similar area that we have now. Uh, this is North Haida Gwaii. Again, uh, I apologize for that, but I think people on the, on the Zoom can see it better, I think. So this is all kelp around here. And these are little zooms of these areas with lots of kelp. And this is again from the Nautico charge. And in green is more recent from archives in British Columbia, showing similar areas. So that was our first step to validate those, those maps from the Nautical Charge. The second one was looking at a, a, bath, a bathymetry layer. So kelp in BC, generally, uh, we assume that it cannot develop beyond 30 meters depth. So we rarely see kelp around 30 meters depth. It's always 30 or lower, like 20 meters, 10 meters, six meters. Those are the good depths for kelp, right? So what we did, we built up a bathymetry map for the entire British Columbia at very high resolution. And we look at areas and we overlay the kelp maps with those areas. So every time that the kelp, as see here in green, are in depths lower than 40 meters, we can trust that is a good map. If the kelp is in area that are uh, deeper than 40 meters, which is this white area here in the middle. This is Galliano Island, for example. This pink polygon here is kelp that we map with the nautical charge, but it's in depth higher than 40 meters. So that is not a good uh, kelp map, right? So from this analysis, we define that about 99% of the kelp areas happen in areas where the depth is shallower than 40 meters. So 99% of the If okay. I can answer your question. Yeah, well, could you just go back to that, the purple off Galliano Island? Are, are, are you saying that uh, the charting was inaccurate? Because fact, yeah. It should not have been. It should not, because everything that is white here is a depth of about 40 meters or deeper. And when we map the, the, the kelp with the, the British Admiral charts, it, the kelp is in this location here where the pink is. But at the end of the day, this is actually a little bit of an artifact because we know there's a lot of kelp here in Galliano Island. However, when the British were drawing the kelp, they were not very precise about the distance from the coast because when we look at satellite data, the kelp is actually right here within the 30 meters bathymetry, right? So this is just displaced basically, but it's still, we used it as, as, okay, this is wrong. So we don't take that one in consideration, right? Okay. So, oh, we got, oh, we got, yeah. all right. So from that on, we say, okay, now we have a good baseline from, from a hundred years ago. So we are all good. So here is, a kelp map again for the entire British Columbia. And this is a zoom for the area that we guys, all the bodies knows here. So this is kind of Great Victoria around here, Sydney, the Gulf Islands and so. So here is right where we are approximately, right? So here is where kelp was in the 1800s, right? Lots of kelp around the Victoria and the, and the Gulf Islands at that time. So if you zoom in on Oh, maybe I shouldn't touch it. <laughs> Big hands. So, so what I did was, okay, now I have to look what's happening 
uh, currently, right? And uh, by currently, I mean, we can't go in a boat in BC and sample every single region in British Columbia. It would be huge time and very expensive and we don't have people or money to do that. Luckily, my expertise is in satellite data use, right? So I said, okay, let's go back as far as we can with satellite data, which is from the first Landsats launched in 1973. This is a, an America, a NASA satellite. And uh, there are many of them, including to now. So there's Landsat 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We're in Landsat 9 right now. And then the Europeans start to launch satellites. The French launched satellites as well. So there's Sentinel with the European Space Asian spots with the French. And then there's some kind of very fancy, all of these guys here are really fancy, very, what we call very high resolution satellite so the smallest area that these these satellites see on the ground is either two meters or higher so it can actually if it's looking at us here if there was no roof and there's a satellite coming by it could see those people there separate from those people here because the smallest area that sees on the ground is two meters so a lot of the image that you guys see on the news these days about which got very popular about the the issue the conflict in ukraine comes from uh this satellite here worldview uh three uh or the planet scope which had very high spatial resolution so you can see people pretty much people on the ground right so i take advantage of this data for mapping kelp the only problem is this this data here are free these data here are very expensive, right? So that's the issue. So I'm very limited because of resources to buy data from these satellites, but we're doing the best that we can. So we go through a big process all in a, oops, all digitally. And, uh, and from that, we start to look at areas of kelp. So what I did here, I, I put here a little snapshot, which again, unfortunately you can't see very well. But if you look around, this is what's in white, it's an island and I masked it in a satellite image. So I digitally removed the land out of it. And what you see in dark is water and the deep waters around it, I also remove. And what you see in, in red here, it's actually, light coming from whatever is floating in the water. And this light is in the infrared part of the spectra. That's why I put this little plot here. So the red line here represents dense kelp in the water, floating in the water. So what satellite can detect is the kelp that is floating in the water. It does not see under the water. And this is in the y-axis, light coming from the water, and the x-x is the different part of the light spectra, the sun spectra, in which we call this the blue part of the spectra, the green, the red, and from 700 up, we call it the infrared part of the spectra, which we can't see it, right? So we see the blue, green, and red. So when we look at kelp, if we're pedalboard and you look at kelp, you're gonna see it a bit reddish, brownish. And that's because as you, as you see this red light here, there's reflectance from the red part of the spectrum kelp. The rest of the light is absorbed for photosynthesis for growth in the blue and the green spectra. Uh, when you look at the infrared spectra, the amount of light reflecting from kelp is this one here. So it's like three, four times larger than what you see in the red spectra right, that we can see, satellites can see in the infrared spectra. So I take advantage of that. Any infrared light that is coming out of the, from the water and the satellite is detecting is likely kelp floating the water. And from that, I map my kelp. So now these red areas here are classified areas of kelp. So this is a map. So I have this as an image. I know the theory behind it and I map it digitally. I map the kelp areas. So how good are those maps? So the same thing that I did with the nautical charts, we do with the satellite image. We make sure that they are actually kelp. So we look at uh, underwater uh, drone videos with those little uh, drones, robots. We look at above water with above water drones. We do uh, some diving and diving data from the DFO, helicopter data from Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, we, are, we work with First Nations, coastal communities, 
uh, sea kayak uh, clubs. So we work with everybody that may have some field data or data from the ground to validate how well our classifications are. And they're pretty good, actually. It's quite surprised that these satellites, and they are about 700 kilometers above the Earth's surface, right? So they're really high and they can actually see kelp quite well. It's quite impressive. Okay, so now it's gonna be a bit of a nightmare because I don't think you can see anything, but now I'm gonna just show you a little bit of example of uh, how environmental conditions change kelp distributions. And I'm gonna focus a little bit, oh, that's so much better. Uh, uh, I'm gonna focus a little bit in the south of Vancouver Island and part of Haida Gwaii, okay? So this is from the British Admiral charts, or you see, so here are the Gulf Islands, and Greater Victoria here, right? Uh, Senet Chinglet is right here in the middle. So from the British charts, this yellow area are the kelp areas with kelp. At that time, when those charts, or at least part of that time, when the, when the British were putting together those charts, which I highlighted here in blue, we have some warm events, and this is uh, ocean temperature in which when it goes red and time, this is from 1914 to 2020 approximately. So when it goes red, it seems that we have warmer temperature than the total average of these years. When it's blue, it seems that we have colder temperature than the average of all these years. So when the charts were put together, we had some warm events, but we had a lot of cold events. So generally speaking, around the 1900s, uh, we had much colder temperatures on average than, for example, what we're seeing presently, right? So there's much more red here than uh, uh, um, uh, blues, right? So this was a phase which likely the environmental conditions were generally good for kelp with many more colder years than actual warmer ocean years. And then if you jump here, which is an, another snapshot that I put here for a, a, a summary of 2014 to 2017, uh, where we had a very large warm event. And during these years in the ocean, we had what was called the blob in which the entire North Pacific warm up for years and years and years, including the British Columbia coast. So during those years, during the blob years, the ocean was very warm. This was also a, a, a very permanent feature of positive El Ninos, which bring very warm waters to British Columbia. So it was terrible. So when that happened, uh, hopefully you can see, again, this is the same uh, map, but with the different colors, right? In which this is from 2014, 2017. So some areas here have the same kelp as the uh, 1800s. Uh, some areas here in the Gulf Islands actually lost a lot of kelp. So we don't see that kelp anymore, right? So indicating the environmental conditions were definitely not good for kelp at that time. If you look at many areas of this region uh, around South of Vancouver Island, and I'll, I'll, I'll navigate these plots with you. So changes in South of Vancouver Island and Gulf Islands from 2005 to 2022. And each of those lines, call it different lines, represent slightly different regions within this entire region in which those regions have more dynamic or less dynamic waters. For example, the Strait of Juan de Fuca uh, brings a lot of dynamic, lots of currents, lots of wind, and that makes the system really cold, generally speaking. The Gulf Islands, on the other hand, has much less currents. So when it's a warm year, it gets really warm. So what do we see generally speaking here? And the lower part here means that red, so these are years for the same years, I uh, start here 2005, and I put it backwards a little bit from 2000. When you see red here, uh, for these kind of uh, uh, El Nino Pacific Decade Oscillation Indices, which are dictate the environmental conditions in British Columbia, when you see red here, uh, not good for kelp, it's generally warmer. When you see blue, it's generally good for kelp, colder waters. When you see very red uh, during the blob years that I mentioned in previous slides, not very good 
bad for kelp, very warm, and so on. So when you look at these kind of warmer conditions here dictated by the indices, and you look at what happened with kelp, it was a little bit lower. When conditions start to get colder year after year after year, we have slightly higher area of kelp. This is kelp cover here in the YX. So for all the regions had the higher kelp areas. When we have the blob happening, 2014, 15, 16, the kelp really went down. Some areas actually almost close to zero, right? Some of those regions. And then it continues warm for a little while. So it's still low here. And the conditions start to improve around 2020 in terms of those indices. And we can see some shifts happening in kelp area. Right, not exactly what happened here during 2010, 2009, which had we had a long, long period of cold conditions. So that tells you a story that depending on the environmental conditions, such as temperature, you may have areas that will lose kelp, and other areas will not lose as much kelp because the temperature is not heavily affected because it's a dynamic region. Other areas such as the Gulf Islands actually get heavily impacted by environmental conditions because it's not as dynamic. And they return to a level, not all the areas to the same level, or they disappear for good. And I'm going to show to you guys in Haida Gwaii some area that totally lost kelp in the last uh, 50, 60 years. So this is Haida Gwaii, and this is a, a, a focus study that we did here, right here in Kaushua Inlet, right? And we look in space and time, how much kelp disappear in this region. So this is kind of a drone image from a kelp, right? So it's flying over this area, and this is us here doing field work in the boat there. So these are very large kelps in Haida Gwaii, quite, uh, quite beautiful. Those are the giant kelps. In, in, this, in the Strait of Georgia, we mostly have what's called the ball kelp. Very beautiful, but not very large compared to giant kelp. And this is, again, unfortunately, uh, this is a, a video showing from 1973 to 2022, the change in kelps in that focus area in Haida Gwaii. Uh, but the, the video is not showing in, in this laptop. So what I'm gonna try to highlight here to you is, uh, the red here is kelp that was mapped in this specific year, 1973, with the first data from that Landsat-1 satellite, right? And uh, again, unfortunately, we can't see the entire time series. The areas in white represent areas that we, we've seen kelp sometime from 1973 to 2022, right? And we define that as what's called the kelp niche, the areas where kelp can actually develop. But this next slide illustrates what I want to call your attention. So the first map here is what you see in red is the kelp map with the nautical charts from 56 to 1858 to 1956. So there was a lot of kelp in this area. There is a lot of kelp here and a lot of kelp along the shorelines here. Uh, this is from the satellite image in 1973. It's amazing, right? All this kelp here that was mapped by the British, it's still here in 1973. Kelp's area here as well. So, wow, it's quite cool to see that 100 years later or more, the kelp is still here, right? I mean, it comes back every year. It's not the same kelp, right? But the kelp area, it's still viable, right? They develop. And then what we note in 1977, this entire region here disappeared. And then in 1984, even more, it disappeared completely. So we still see kelp areas here and here, but nothing on this area here. And then working with the Haida Council, with the Haida Nations, we understand from their, from their uh, traditional knowledge that that's, that's the quote here, that this area here was an area that they actually use a lot. As, as a kelp bed. So that's an area known by the Haida people uh, of, uh, of having a very large kelp bed. So, but they don't know what happened and when it disappeared. So we figured it out that it disappeared around the end of the, the 1970s, beginning of the 1980s, based on the satellite analysis. So this area that disappeared corresponded to about 1,500 American football fields, just to put in perspective. We think this is 
probably one of the largest continuous kelp bed ever in British Columbia, based on the other areas that we've been analyzing in BC. And that's gone. We can't, uh, we've been there, field work, and there's no kelp whatsoever. So we've been, we did a lot of, so this area here that I'm holding a kelp is actually here, lots of kelp here. The area that disappeared mostly is this area here. We can't find any kelp. We thought was sea urchins. We went there, sent the, the robots under the water, no sea urchins whatsoever. What we found was there was the development of an invasive understory macroalgae that took the entire habitat and now is the habitat for that macroalgae. So kelp cannot develop that any longer. So there was a shift on the conditions at the end of 1970s and beginning of the 80s that caused kelp to disappear in that area and it never returned. And the not invasive species took, not invasive, opportunistic species took the habitat. So that's happening in a few areas along British Columbia. So if you look at uh, this is kelp area and this is time. And uh, what you see here, and uh, this is 1970s around here. And this is for this region here that I call it number one. So lots of kelp in the 1970s, something happened around 1977 that the kelp went down and never came back. All the area just south of it, lots of kelp before went down, oscillates a little bit, but it never returned to previous levels. Also something happened in this area. And when we look at the environmental conditions, we find that prior to the disappearance of kelp, there was a lot of blues here, meaning good environmental conditions. And then for a very long time, this entire region was subject to what we call not, uh, not positive conditions for kelp. That's what's highlighted in reds here. So year after year after year, the conditions were poor for kelp. And likely that's what happened. And then this, this opportunistic species came in and colonized the entire habitat. So it's kind of a lost habitat at this point. Other regions here actually has been very resilient. And even though they went down during this period, they return. So there's no understory kelp colonizing those areas. So what we see in many areas of British Columbia, including here in Haida Gwaii, is there are loss of kelp which was illustrated by this region here. And there are areas in which kelp varies and it's resilient. It goes down and given that the environmental conditions change and become positive, colder conditions, they can rebound and return to a certain level, not necessarily uh, uh, very high levels, but they can still return. So, which is basically what the literature that I showed to you in the beginning of the talk tells us there are many stories uh, around the coast of British Columbia in regard to kelp. And we're trying to do this in a local level with the satellite image, looking at many areas to see what's happened globally wise in British Columbia. So with that, uh, I'm gonna just say uh, what's next for us. So this, this, uh, this map here with the little purple dots represent all the satellite image that we have to analyze. So I present data from here. I present data from a small area on Haida Gwaii. We're looking at the Broughton area right now with the Broughton nations. We're looking at the west coast of Vancouver Island, the entire Haida Gwaii and the rest of the Salish Sea. So now my lab is working in many areas in British Columbia, following the same methods to have a better understanding of resilience and laws of kelp in British Columbia. So many of this uh, work that we're doing right now is co-led with many communities and including many nations, uh, which is tremendous because they do have a lot of knowledge and a lot of interest in, in management of their own marine territories. So it's, it brings this ownership, which is very important for us uh, to incorporate in, in our research. But as I said before, there's lack of data. And one of the things that I, I do a lot is write proposals to find money to buy very high resolution data. The one that I mentioned to you guys that I have to buy that I can't download for free. So, so I, can, I can have more data for this entire region. And uh, what we want to do is define the areas in which we can see kelp losses, areas that are stable. And so these areas can be protected or restored. Right? So where kelp has lost, 
why is it lost? Is it worth to invest to restore those areas? Maybe not because the environmental conditions are not good enough for that region anymore. So there's a cost benefit on that. How about other areas that are varying, but are still resilient? Maybe those are the areas that needs to be protected and needs to be restored if it's, if it's, uh, if it's applicable, right? And the other thing that uh, i am uh, recently applied for a DFO large grant, hopefully I'm gonna get, get, is looking at the kelp health condition. And that's because what we have been witness in the last years is the problem of, with uh, what we call the bryozones, right? So a kelp blade is nice and brown and very elastic when it's healthy. Uh, when you have this bryozone, which is a plankton epiphyte that colonizes the, the blade and form big colonies. So this is a zoom that you see here. And the, the blade becomes infested with those colonies. And from, from, a, from an outside, you see as white patches. Uh, and this, what, had, what, the, what happened with this, the kelp breaks very easily, right? And, and sunks because the colony is so heavy that the blade starts to sunk. So the kelp cannot photosynthesize anymore because it's not exposed to that sunlight that it needs to photosynthesize. So it's something uh, quite uh, incredible that it's happening. And many of us are seeing this more and more along the coast of British Columbia. So we're trying to see if we can find resources to look into what are the environmental conditions that are leading this kind of bryozone infestation along the British Columbia coast. So hopefully I'm gonna get that, which in parallel, we're gonna be running uh, with this kind of area extend from the satellite point of view. So with that, I will, oh, that was another video. That is so beautiful. This is from the Broughton Archipelago. This is the underwater drone, the little robot. Uh, and this is within a, a bow kelp bed. And you can see here, so this is all bow kelp, right? And it's like, it's like if you're in an aquarium, it's absolutely beautiful, right? This is a very health kelp bed and there's so many fish, it's hard to believe. So it's, it's quite incredible when you can actually go under and see how they have, what is the richness of this habitat? And with that, I'll say thank you. And uh, I'm, uh, any question that you have, I'm, I'm here to answer. Thank you. Hope oh, it's not too fast <laughs> or too slow. So yes. I've got a couple of questions and remarks, but first of all, I'd like to compliment you on your English. Um, perfectly understandable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, not my students. Not always agree with you on that. <laughs> but I don't really care these days. I'm too old to care about my English. So I just talk. <laughs> okay. um, the first point was that um, I noticed you didn't. Um, you, you, you carried the the hydrographic data backwards only until about the. Um, um, sort of 1970s, 1920s. Um, but the actual 18th, 18, 1850. Yeah, but, yeah. but the, the later, the later. Oh, yes. The later, later, yeah. Later, um, sort of post satellite, presumably. Um, but the, the majority of the kelp mapping was done by Captain Richards in the late 1850s, mm -hmm. um, which coincided with a very low series of years. Um, uh, on a few years, two years at least, uh, Vancouver Harbour froze up, and then and the um, the Fraser River froze up. So it would be very useful. That would have been a very favourable time for the kill. So that's why it was mapped perhaps at maximum. Yeah. Well, that's I, I will and, definitely and, and course, try to get that information from you where I can find all of so, that. Yeah. And, um, and oh, part, pardon me for just what could you just repeat for the online audience oh. what the observation yeah. was sorry apparently they can hear it just fine okay you're, you're okay <laughs> thank you okay <laughs> wonderful sorry sir this, you had another comment yes the um, infrared mapping of kelp you said it was on dead kelp no, it's uh, if it's if it's dead, actually, the infrared is not that strong. It has to be, it's just like uh, trees, any vegetation, land-based vegetation. If we could see infrared, the world would be absolutely infrared. 
And it's not thermal infrared. It's called mm -hmm. reflective infrared. It's basically just after the red part of the spectra. So when, when vegetation is dead, it doesn't have a strong reflectance in the infrared any longer, which is the same for kelp. The strongest reflectance is it's when alive. And that's due to the interaction of light within the cells themselves of the leaves. <laughs> And, and the, the other point was that we're learning that, um, well, certainly that the, the kelp forest was a major factor in the population of this part of the world yeah. um, hundreds of thousands of years ago. The kelp highway the theory. The kelp highway, exactly. Yeah. And I wondered if the first, the first people here um, actually were a factor in preserving the kelp, just as we know that they, they uh, made kelp gardens, they made uh, clam gardens mm -hmm. and so on. Did they do anything positive to, to foster the growth of, and the, the preservation of kelp? Not that I'm aware. And on talking with uh, nations, right, there is, how do I say, there's some of the history that is not very easy to retreat, to recover, right, uh, even with elders and so. Uh, so not, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I don't think, based on conversation with, uh, with nations, that the restoration or the preservation of kelp areas was something important. They use the kelp areas, right? They use kelp for many things as food, as, as they, they make artifacts from it. They make all kinds of stuff at, at a, period, a long time ago, right? From, from all of this. Uh, but from my understanding, that it was not a concern. However, said that, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, the kelp, uh, uh, the kelp, uh, migration uh, theory, right? The, the pathway of kelp, it, it seemed that was something important for them uh, as, as, as area that they would move around the, the Pacific coast. Right? Not the kelp itself, the kelp the ecosystem. Oh, the kelp ecosystem, right? Likely, but I don't think, I, I never encountered any information that there was some kind of uh, uh, management of the kelp ecosystem. Thank you. It was a very interesting talk. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Yes. Um, well, um, you, you mentioned uh, the role of uh, seawater temperature in uh, extended kelp beds. It, now, do you think there are, there are other factors that have that are contributing to the uh, decrease in, in kelp uh, on the BC coast in the last 100 plus years? Yes, yes, there are other factors, not necessarily. Why do I talk more uh, generally speaking about ocean temperature? Because it's been shown global wise as one of the main physical drivers. And to a certain extent, we can get data from satellite, which is easier, right? Uh, for example, sea urchins in, in, in areas in which we have data, especially from DFO, we've seen changes in kelp distribution, which are related to sea urchins. But this data is very sparse. We don't have a good spatial temporal database of sea urchin that allows us to relate change based on sea urchins, right? So for localized areas, sea urchins is a big player. Another thing that we're strongly looking at is uh, uh, wind storms. Because uh, if they get more frequent and strong, then we may have uh, 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 changes in kelp settlement, depending on when, when it happens, right? So if they are fully settled, it's one condition. If they're just starting to grow, maybe they're going to be lost, right? Some years I've seen here, uh, like in Telegraph Bay Beach, close to where I live, um, uh, some years, even in May, when you start to see the kelp developing, uh, you can't see it above water yet. Uh, th this past year, I saw a lot of baby kelp coming to shore after big wind storms. So depending on the intensity and how long it lasts, you may have impact on that, right? We don't think that uh, light plays a big role in BC, light availability. Right, we have uh, the, the, the water turbidity is not high enough to, we're not 100% sure, we're looking at data on that, but light availability doesn't seem that could be a main factor. Yeah. And, um, would you be able to go back on your slide um, to the one about two back where you were showing the, the uh, area in between in the in Haida Kauai? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you, you tell me where to stop. Oops. 
Maybe I go here. Just interested in, oh. in the seawater temperature. Uh, I can't move it. <laughs> I can't. Oops, here we go. Uh, yeah, over here, that one. Now, the this one? The left hand side, that, that suggests that the, uh, you know, the, uh, the orange, that's, the max is 22.4. But isn't it extraordinary that, are you saying that in that area, that's the seawater temperature uh, up, you know, up off that island and also in and deep in the inlet? Yes. So what, what was your question? Well, 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 it, 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 um, how come it's so warm? Yeah, so this is, this is like a, what, we call see, what we call a climatology, means it's an average for the summertime, right? It's not a full year. That's not considered winter temperatures. Mm -hmm. So it's a summer average for this region, showing that, because what was intriguing us is, okay, so why this area lost all the kelp? Why not the inlets? Right? Because when we look at the inlet data for temperature, generally they are the warmer areas. Not, not, this is an exposed area in the east part of Haida Gwaii, exposed to the, not to the Pacific, right? to, to, to the inside paths. So, so why this area? Uh, then we, we look at uh, uh, what we call high resolution Landsat uh, temperature data. Uh, that, that's thermal infrared spectra now. And we build uh, what we call a climatology, which is an average for all the summer in our data series. And what we notice is generally this area here, it's much warmer than this region here, which may have explained why this area never really, because it could have recovered. It went through many warm years as these areas went through, but it could have recovered around here, but it never did. Right, so generally it's a warmer area, and then that really stressed the kelp population. And uh, you know, the kelp they, they release these sporophytes uh, at the end, like in, in the in the at the end of the summer. Those are the little female and male. They release it in the water, and next year they start to grow again. So for many years this was not happening in this area, likely because of those high summer temperatures. Right, so these sporophytes never developed, and they were not released. Kelp never returned, and then this kind of opportunistic species came in and took the habitat. But do we understand why? Uh, oh, why does this warmer? Oh, yeah, it's currents. Yeah, we understand. So tidal currents here, we understand why, right? We just didn't have true data showing, and then we actually have local data now that shows that. Yes, yes. Um, and we have a few questions online and okay. Melissa will read yes. them out. All right. So we have a question from Jess Poutier. Um, were other charts examined from different explorers other than English? I'm thinking more of Grayfoot Sound area and Spanish, uh, Spanish hydrographer uh, Tofino. Or would that data be included in British charts? Ooh, yeah, you caught me. I have no idea. <laughs> so because basically I, you know, uh, let's say I didn't check which country provided charts. They are all called the BA charts, right? Uh, so maybe it's a mix, but the way that the, the hydrographic serve organized then they call the BA charts, right? So I do apologize. So maybe there's some information about that. Yes, I can answer that. No, the Spanish didn't. didn't um didn't charge uh, kelp at all. They were, they were just doing reconnaissance, uh, reconnaissance charts. So the, the first maps were Richard's, the uh, Royal Navy. Yeah, here you go. Any, any other questions? Okay, okay. Uh, just, I would just like you to, if you would, repeat the information about the Spanish hydrographer and the topics, we could be historical. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that right at the end. Okay, yeah, absolutely. You have any other questions? I believe I have. One more from Norma Campbell. Uh, what is the name of the species that took hold in place? Sorry. What is the name of the species that took hold in place are the West Coast kelp? If you mean the, the, the kelp in Haida Gwaii, the, the opportunistic species, it's a turf. I can't remember the scientific name right now, but it's a turf species. It's kind of a red algae as well. And it's a very kind of, a, it's a hard one, but I can't remember the scientific, if that's what this person referred to, if it's the one in Haida Gwaii. Right. Yeah, it's turf. Gen a general name for it is turf, like we call kelp general name. I think, uh, 
this, there was a oh. John? I have a question. I think the gentleman might have a question too. Um, uh, relationship between kelp and sea otters. Do you have you done any work on, on that? I have not, but we're starting to look into that in the Broughton region because in the last three years, there's hundreds of sea otters coming back in the Broughton. And then mm -hmm. with the with the, the body, which is a First Nations initiative. So within body, we are gonna to start to look at historical kelp and when the, the, the sea otters start to return to that region to see if we can see differences. Right now, we don't know. We know a few areas that have lost kelp in that region completely, and we're trying to track those areas. And uh, we're trying now to put together some data on sea otters as well. Just a, a long standing story that when um... You know, Captain Cook arrived and alerted uh, the, the West to the fact that there were sea otters here. The sea otters were depopulated, the sea urchins exploded, that reduced the kelp. And so if you're looking at maps from the 1850s, it's a period perhaps when there's you no, know, you know, a few sea otters. Yeah, there. yeah. So maybe it was, again, that is a baseline, but maybe it's not the best baseline because at that point, the sea otters were already, you know, gone or yeah. uh, getting in the way to be to disappear. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but I, it's the best that we we can do right now. Yes. But I'm just wondering, are there any areas around Victoria which has lost a lot of kelp? Uh, uh, Victoria, if you think about the, we have a very, if you think about race rocks, blah blah blah. These areas are so dynamic because it gets all this water from the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Right. There's a lot of mixing there. We, from our time series of, uh, of, um, of temperature data, rarely the temperature, even in the warmest summers, go above 14 degrees, which is excellent for kelp. So we see change from year to year, but not major disappears. This, is, this, this entire region here is the region that we have the best conditions for kelp, but we see a few areas of change, right? The Gulf Islands, on the other hand, it's a slightly different story. Right? Yeah, but we haven't seen major changes in kelp in this region. There is variability, but not disappeared. Yes. I know you focused on uh, kind of why, but during the same time period, is there any of uh, world colleagues who found a similar occurrence as what you predicted here? For other regions of the world? Yeah. Um, uh, honestly, I think uh, our lab is doing the longest, uh, how do I say that? Well, uh, the longest time series study on kelp. So there's no one in the world that has this level of analysis. It's all current, right? So the only, uh, and I, it, maybe I'm wrong, but the best of my knowledge we have, and it's not just Haida Gwaii, right? So we have this now for many regions in British Columbia. I just use Haida Gwaii in South of Vancouver Island as a snapshot uh, um, for easy presenting the data. But yes, so everybody, you know, that global map that I showed in the beginning is mostly what's happening now. And when they say there's a loss of kelp, it's like in the last 10 years. Right, but going back in time and really understand long time series, we are the first group doing that. Uh, probably wise, I guess. <laughs> so it's kind of a cool, yeah. Um, I just wanted to step up. I see Leanne online. You have a question, but we can't hear you. So you'd have to put type that into the chat. We've, We've looked after it? Yeah. Okay, okay. great. So um, I think we're out of questions now, or do we have one more? Any more? One more from Jesse. Okay. okay. So he asked, uh, what other ecological data do you wish 19th century map makers had recorded? Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, I guess the Dempsey urchins, <laughs> that would be tremendous, but not necessarily they would be looking to that. Right, but uh, uh, I, I, that's an interesting question, right? It was so amazing that they did that um, uh, and that we can use that now and, uh, and it is available actually. Anyone can go uh, in the, either in our webpage, in the, my lab webpage or in the Canadian Hydrographic Service and, and download the entire data, right? For this baseline for any area in British Columbia. Uh, but other data that, yeah, if there was some biological information it would be tremendous, right? But 
I can only imagine that that would be an impossible mission. It's impossible for us right now with all the resources that we have. I can only imagine a hundred years ago, right? So they mapped kelp because there was a need. As far as I know, it's not an ecological <coughs> issue, right? There's also the, 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 the actual, uh, nine, there's a 1913, or is it 1916? I can't remember right now, by Cameron. And Cameron, I don't know if you've seen that, it's a full report that was requested by the Canadian government, by the BC government, I guess at that time. Uh, and uh, he did map kelp in the Gulf Islands to, to a density level. So he has actually a, a map, he drew a map and he used different uh, uh, shaded parameters to define density of kelp. And that was because kelp uh, had a lot of potassium and uh, in, term, in times of war, that would be a good thing. So the, the BC government requests Cameron to do that report and uh, uh, Washington had it as well. So we have some information very detailed from the 1913 because of the richness of potassium in kelp. So it was a navigation hazard and a source of uh, potassium to make power gun, I guess, right? And I think we're going to try to see if Leanne can get through the speakers. Leanne? Hi, can you hear me okay? Oh, great. Yeah. There we go. Super. Well, it's been a pleasure to join you this afternoon from Seashell Territory, and I thank your excellent hosts and your excellent presentation, Maya Sierra. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I uh, live in Seashell, in Seashell Territory, and I also spend time in Sla Amin uh, Territory in Powell River. And I was wondering if you are doing or planning to do work in this area, and if you're familiar with the Skookumchak Seashell Inlet kelp population, that I have personally observed shrink and decline in the time that I've been on the coast here. And also my second question, please, um, is how sensitive is the satellite data to detect subtitle kelp species? Um, so the first, for your first question, uh, we will, our goal is to do for the entire coast of British Columbia. So mm -hmm. we're going into kind of little pieces and the puzzle hopefully is gonna be finishing in a, in a few years. So this is part of uh, an NSERC and the NSERC is the, the Canadian National Foundation for Research Funds. So it's called an NSERC Alliance and we have the British Columbia Kelp Resilience Project, which we call Kelper uh, with the NSERC. So we have this project going on and hopefully we'll be able to cover the entire coast of British Columbia. Have I looked at the specific area where we are? you are? Uh, not necessarily, but we will be looking at and it will be tremendous if you can reach me at my email address and send any information, if it's oral, photographs, whatever you may have, uh, so we can add that to the analysis when we're looking at that area. So, Great. so, and for the second question, I spaced out, I can't remember what was it. Um, the, how, how does it detect subtitle kelp? Oh, yes. So, uh, Let's, how do I answer that? So not necessarily because it depends a lot on how deep is the water column and the turbidity of the water. So for the satellite to detect subtidal kelp or underwater kelp, the light has to go through the water column, interact with the kelp, come back again through the water column and be reflected out of the water. So this water column part does attenuate or means absorb and scatter radiation a lot and we lose the actual strong signal for kelp. If it's very shallow, we still may have some infrared signal, but not necessarily. The other factor is water molecules, ocean, doesn't matter which water is, absorb infrared radiation a lot. So as soon as it penetrates in the water column, it starts to be absorbed. And then it's very difficult for this light to reach any depth and come back to the satellite. So not an easy task. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I've learned some more today. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you well, so much. That was Thank wonderful. you again. Yeah. And thank you everybody for coming and your support as we... Uh, underway.